My name is Jordan Weiss, and I'm presenting Microphilia Emerging today. It's a PowerPoint presentation on some of the wonders of fungi in our local human-based habitats and what we can do to uh, realize a little bit more abundance in our own home units and with our communities. So this first picture we have here, these are just a couple of mushrooms that occur in uh, different habitats around Portland, Oregon, and most of these mushrooms occur in other habitats around the country. So this first picture is a Drosophy Procox, Procox. It's called the Spring and it's a very common mushroom that fruits in uh, the spring in wood chip beds, mulch beds, and it's one of the most common mushrooms that people see in the springtime. There's not a lot of information on its edibility, but people have been eating it for a number of years with no real consequences. I've eaten some of these mushrooms before, cooked in butter, and it really does a wonderful job in the taste better. So you can cook a lot of things in butter and it'll probably taste better. Everything's better in butter. Everything's better in butter. Welcome to Microphilia Immersion. So my intro and wife just started. We're going over a couple pictures here. Uh, that picture in the middle, that's Shaggy Maine. And those are very, they're some appropriate mushrooms that love growing in uh, sides of roads, other places where humans have been with heavy equipment. They're a primary sap road, which means that they're one of the first organisms to colonize a new substrate. Uh, we've seen shaggy names popping up underneath concrete. We've seen them coming out of asphalt. Uh, they're a big decomposer of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And they're one of the mushrooms that plays pretty well into microremediation. The next picture is another member of the same genus. It's called Caprinus micaceus. It's the mica cap. This is a saprobic fun fungus that turns up at the base of thin bark hardwood trees, usually in the spring. Uh, macroscopic, macroscopic identification characteristics for the mica cap are when they're fresh, they have this little sheen on them. It looks like mica has been crushed up and sprayed on them. They're always in a clustered habitat, which is cespitose in Latin, and they're always available in the spring. They're not really hunted for food, but they have tremendous microremediation potential uh, for de decomposing wood woody debris and stuff. The mushroom down in the middle is the woolly inky cap, that's Copernopsis lodopus. Uh, that's another common mushroom that people see in the springtime coming up in the mulch beds and in the gardens. Uh, usually the mushroom will come up in the morning and by the time the afternoon sun comes up, it's usually desiccated the top so they just kind of shrivel up. And usually just the white stems are left over. Uh, this mushroom is another primary sap rope and I see it grow a lot of places. To have this mushroom in your garden, you'll know that you're decomposing material and that it's uh, creating habitat for other soil dwellers like worms. The last picture on this slide is brown cups, so it's a Pisiza vesiculosa. It's a popular springtime mushroom, it's an Ascomycete, and they often share the same habitats as morels. So sometimes people will make morel beds or just regular mushroom beds, and then they'll have the brown cup pop up on it. And, uh, people have used it for medicinal purposes, it's a blood thinner. Uh, I think in traditional Chinese medicine it has cool wind properties. Uh, if anybody wants to find out more about the medicinal value of mushrooms, Robert Rogers' book, The Fungal Pharmacy, is the best book probably ever written on medicinal mushrooms. So I recommend people get that if they don't already have it. I'll be stopping periodically to ask questions and see if anybody has any answers or other questions. Because most of the stuff I've learned about mushrooms is in the book. Mycophilia emerging. So some of the wonders and the beauty of the fungal world and how these emergent technologies are helping people rebuild communities by reducing the waste stream, taking an active role in locally sourced food security, and ecological restoration using proven low-tech mycological systems. Would you still have a couple of slides of that and you can still have a couple of slides? 
Would you like to press the button? Excellent, thank you. So, it's just this button right here, that first one? Left. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I'm directioning the time. You can go one more time. King Strafaria, wine caps. In Germany, they call this mushroom garden juice. This mushroom was first described in the 1920s from New Jersey by a mycologist named Muriel. Uh, I've heard stories of people on the East Coast who used to grow this mushroom in companion planting strategies in the 20s and 30s, which uh, if any of those people were studying biodynamic farming and they were doing the, this polyculture in this country, that would have been a pretty evolutionary leap in food production and closing the loops in our various uh, outdoor growing spaces. King Strafaria is a subtropic fungus, which means it's the first to attack a new substrate, but it also has the ability to become a secondary uh, prime, a secondary sector, which means it requires the action of bacterial decay before it can start fruiting. And that, lends, that makes it, that gives it a property that lends itself well to uh, companion plant strategies. So for the last few years, I've been growing this mushroom in various companion planting strategies, uh, raised beds with mulch plants, Google culture projects, sheet mulching, and it's Google. Google culture. Google culture is a German, it's a German practice for uh, building soil. So what they do in Google culture is, Seth Holzer is a big proponent of it, they'll dig a trench on their land and they'll fill it with woody debris and fill it with logs and sticks, with root logs, with organic waste. Uh, usually they'll dig it a couple feet deep and then they'll pile the stuff up a couple feet high. What a lot of people like to do is they like to take turf, grassy turf, and they like to put they like to rip it up in strips and put the grassy side on the hula culture so the root side is exposed. So this kind of uh, it, it kind of helps with decomposition and your Google culture project one year will be this tall, the next year it will be this tall, and you'll start to have a uh, variety of plants growing out of it. Once the Google cultures are kind of established and you have annuals and perennials on it, all the ecological niches on that project are filled, so you don't really have to worry about pulling out leaves. It's all kind of a happy they, I had to think about them too. They work really good as like ferns for uh, like trying to control an off fields. Mm -hmm. that when, when you build a burn, just go ahead and cut whatever trees you cut down, throw in that. And then that way you can direct it all one direction and then maybe have like a King Shafaria uh, uh, firm at the area where it flows through so that it'll, it'll help remediate the uh, uh, water the runoff water. Yeah, that's that's an excellent that's an excellent point. Thank you for pointing that out. Paul Stamets, he got a patent on microfiltration on his land because he had a big cows in his land, so there was some affluent coming off of his land that had people call upon him on it. And what he did is he used the King's Grove Barrier microfiltration. They're also called habitat properties. So what he does is uh, takes burlap sacks. I like to cut the burlap sack in half, either the long way or the short way either the long way, either the short way or the long way. Uh, what I've found with making habitat buffers is if they have more than 50 pounds of material in them, they tend to get a little bit of anaerobic decomposition in them. So if I, if I just took my coffee, my burlap sack, and I cut it in half on the long way, I'll sew up the outside edge, and then I will mix it with King Strafaria and wood chips. So the King's Strafaria, once it naturalizes and it's on wood chips, it's a lot easier to work with. For uh, a habitat buffer that's half the length of a copy of the burlap sack, I'll put probably 30 pounds of chips in there and mix it with about a pound and a half of uh, spawn. So once that's, and then once that's in there, and I, I'll bounce it on the ground to make sure it's tight, and I want the material to be moving in, inside of it, because if it moves, it'll delay uh, colonization. As the King's Reform and Mycelium is colonizing this new substrate, the, hypo, the hyphae and the mycelium, they're one, they're one cell thing. So 
if they're in an area where there's not a lot of movement, they can colonize faster, but if there's a tiny bit of movement, it can break those, it can break those hypo connections and might delay your colonization. Uh, if you fill up one of these habitat buffers and you leave it on the ground for more than a month, the tensile strength on the bottom where the uh, wood chips and the earth come in contact will weaken the bag, which is a sign that it's working, but if you try to lift up the bag after a month, all the contents will fall out. So if you're going to create a habitat buffer for microfiltration using Pinsterfaria and wood chips, when you lay down your when you lay down your habitat buffer, make sure it's where you want it to be. Hi, welcome. This is Michael Philly of Merchant. Yeah. I need it. No, 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 <laughs> welcome. Uh, one of the people who brought this uh, delicious when in button stage suprobic garden from the fungus back into the kitchen of public consciousness was Paul Stanis. In his book, Suicide Mushrooms and Their Allies, it was published in 1979 on Homestead Books. It had pictures of King Strafari in it and it outlined a couple of low tech strategies that he was using. I read that book in 1979 at the tender age of 14, and that was pretty much, I pretty much got put on the path for my college for the rest of my life. Uh, so, it's like this. Oh, actually, the scene is, what looks like this? Oh, I see. I see what's going on. No, no, no. Yeah, it's so you, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this, this big picture of King's Grafaria was taken at the Dharma Rain Zen Center. Yes, sir. Is this the clinic? I've got a patient there. You have a patient? Uh, is, this, is this a clinic here, or is it another building going down? Oh, it's another building. This is the medical center? Yeah. That's next door. Oh, okay. next door. Yeah, I thought sorry, to, right. sorry to interrupt you guys. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I do dispense I do dispense a minutes no much presentation at the end of my presentation. So oh, do you? <laughs> worry about sending them out. Any case, this picture of the King's Trafaria in the middle, it was taken at the Dharma Rain Zen Center in Portland, Oregon, this spring. So in the spring of 2013, he inoculated wood chips. Uh, wood, he dug a hole, inoculated wood chips with this fungus. And this popped out approximately a year later. So I had a mushroom workshop for the Village Building Convergence in Portland, Oregon in May of 2013. And we went around the Dharma Rain Zen Center, which is, it's an old landfill. They, they took out approximately 80 cubic tons of river water. And they replaced, they replaced that with about 80 cubic tons of construction debris from the construction of the 205 and the 84 interchange in Port of Oregon. So this site, it's a 14-acre site. It's been kind of a community liability since first, since they first started putting garbage in there. It's attracted, it's attracted kind of homeless people and people who don't have a lot to do. So it's a community liability. Dharma Rim Zen Center is the Buddhist church in Port of Oregon, and they saw this piece of land as an opportunity to do something new. So they arranged a deal, I think they arranged to buy it. On the 14.9 acre site, uh, they're going to put on, they're going to restore an oak savanna, they're going to put in an intentional community with about 30 units, and they're going to have massive food gardens. So what we did with this mushroom is we put this mushroom in a couple places where we can expand its habitat to kind of catch it some of the uh, pollution that's coming out of the landfill. Uh, we took a tour on the landfill last year and I noticed there's one part on the property that's a ravine that this, the material was just dumped on it so there's one part of the ravine where there's crankcase oil coming out of this head of the ravine and it has a big pool. When we took, when we went on this initial, initial inspection back in last year, this one pool of oil had a bunch of mushrooms fruiting directly underneath it. And those mushrooms were Saffarella species. So I have a couple of pictures of Saffarella species. It's uh, a primary decomposer. It has a white, it does a white light fungus. It does a white light decomposition, which makes it a good candidate for microremediation projects. 
So I didn't analyze any of the mushrooms, but the mushrooms that were growing directly underneath it could have extensively been taking the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and turning them into a food source. I went back there this year, and the oil pool was, the oil puddle was gone. But there was no one there, so I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to ascertain scientifically what could happen. That button mushroom is the perfect stage for eating King's Trafaria. They're comparable to the horse mushroom, and the trimmings are very tasty. You can't see it very well, but that picture on the bottom is a pair of King's Trafaria that busted through the wood chips, and they didn't get watered, so they get kind of eaten pretty fast by spiders. When we do the right work at the right time for installing King's Trafaria in our different projects, whether it's a local culture or a planting strategy or mushroom composting, the right work at the right time to install, to implement this fungus into our garden settings is between late March and early June. It has a fruiting range from 40 degrees to 90 degrees, so if we were to translate that into human terms, the human comfort range would be, I don't know, 98.6 degrees to about 140 degrees. So it's got one of the widest fruiting ranges of any fungus. It grows well with a number of different plants, whether it's annuals, perennials, trees, bushes, and shrubs. It's one of the mushrooms that people are using in their companion planting strategies and home strategies to build soil and to help alleviate some of the problems that come with industrialization. Morels. Morel angusticeps is the black morel. There's been a lot of name changes around morels in the last couple of years. It's dizzying. There's morels that have specific habitats that have brand new names. So the one I used here is angusticeps. Morels are a catastrophia regime organism, which means that it can be found after bulldozers, forest fires, floods, volcanic eruptions, asteroid strikes. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, it dumped a lot of ash, and the following spring there was a massive flush of morels. People probably hadn't seen that morels ever in their lifetime in Washington. They were going up into the slopes, and they were filling their trucks up with morels. One thing they didn't know about is that when morels grow up through burned soil or volcanic ash, they tend to pick up some of that ash in their pits. So what this does is it exacerbates decomposition. The long and short of the story was these people who had hundreds of pounds of morels in their trucks, by the time they drove to town, they were pretty much shot. If there's a volcano and you have morels coming up, you pick them. You can rinse the morels out with water and it will remove some of the ash in the pits and it makes them easier to sell or to dry. Or if you don't wash the ash from the pits and they decompose, you can take all that matter and you can start new morel beds. Treads, I don't know if anybody caught Treads' presentation on how to grow morels, but his book, he has probably the most easy to understand, best practices for growing morels. I would check out his book, Why Don't You Grow Chance. That morel and the morel, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. So the first morel came up in Washington a couple of years ago. The second morel came up probably a few feet from that morel a year later. And the dry winds in Washington, southwestern Washington, is really dry. So by the time this mushroom fruited, and after a couple of days of really dry winds, it just kind of dehydrated right in the ground. Those other morels on the other side, those are river morels from my friend Dustin at the Mushroomery in Lebanon, Oregon. And they collect them, they collect river morels that are this tall. They're incredibly precious. Oyster mushrooms, this is a saprobic fungus that has, it produces a white rot in its host. When a tree in the forest, a thin bark hardwood tree in the forest, has oyster mushrooms growing on it, it will usually suffer a white rot death in a year to a couple of years. 
And these mushrooms are in the forest, fruiting on alders or maples like they do in Oregon. It's one soil building mechanism. So the ground rock funguses, which are the anadermals, the artist cons, the chicken of the woods. There's white rock funguses, which are oysters and turkey tails. When both of these trees are in the same habitat, they're powerful soil building mechanisms. So a tree that suffers from brown rock decomposition will take more than centuries to millennia to kind of decompose. And in that time, it's housing a lot of different organisms. So it's having to turn out to be habitat for them. Uh, when you're going through the forest and you see a rotten tree, if you see, if you see a rotten log with brown cubicle cracking, that's a sign of brown rock. And it usually takes the natural, natural cycle a little longer to break them down. Brown rock funguses don't break down the cellulose, heavy cellulose and lignin as fast as the white rock funguses do. Hence the white rock funguses have been implicated in more uh, remediation strategies. Uh, these mushrooms here on the, on the right side were taken on were growing on alder. We took that picture last fall. These mushrooms were growing on a maple log this spring at a workshop that I was giving in New England. So we took a break from the workshop and we went up into the forest with other house and we had two pounds of oyster mushrooms for lunch. Uh, so, so King Strafaria. This is King Strafaria grown on wood chips on a thin bark hardwood round log. So what I did in the spring is I took a bucket with holes in it and I'm, uh, when I'm doing container strategies, what I'll do is I'll put a couple of holes on the bottom so the fungus can breathe a little bit. Fungus is an aerobic organism, which means it needs oxygen a little bit. So I'll fill up this bucket with a couple of holes on the bottom with some wood chips and then I'll put some naturalized wood chips that have the pink scrofaria mycelium on it I'll put that in the middle, and then I'll take a freshly cut hardwood brown log, usually just a little smaller than the diameter of the bucket. I'll make sure that it gets that it's wet on the bottom, and I'll just put that fresh cut face onto the wood chips that are colonized. I pulled this log out after about a month, and the chips had already bonded, they'd already started to colonize the bottom of the log. What you can do with that, you can continue to have that log colonized, and it's a slow way of, it's a slow, kind of a slow solution of keeping your mycelium going. Or you can take that log that's got mycelium on the bottom and you can stick it into the habitat where you want King Safari. So that acts as a start. And then another picture of this here of that same, this different part of that log where the worms were actually going in and out. So King Safari mycelium attracts a wide variety of soil microbes. Are there any questions so far? Like we're kind of fast, and then sometimes I'm missing stuff. Sometimes questions. So, weren't you just soon after you turned it over like that, or was there more in there? That's a very good question. Once the bottom of this log is colonized, and if it's in its container where it's going to be, if it's colonized to the point where all of my cells can communicate with each other, if the conditions become right, it will produce primordia. Does everybody know what the mushroom life cycle is? Okay, I'm going to go over it really quickly. The mushroom life cycle is the mushroom will drop spores. So not all of the spores land in favorable habitat. Sometimes they get picked up by wind breezes. There's spores that are in the upper atmosphere that have been up there for thousands or millions of years. But the spores that do land in favorable habitat, and for King Strafaria, that would be on um, fresh, fresh wood and in the mulch garden, in this release for the soil. Those spores will send out hyphae. So the hyphae is similar to a root, except it's not alive in photosynthesis. It's decomposing different organic substrates in the soil. As the hyphae secretes powerful acids and enzymes from its hyphal tips, it's digesting the food in front of it before it takes it inside. As those hypo tips go colonize the soil, they're looking for a compatible mate. 
So in a mushroom, when you take a spore print of a mushroom and you have a spore drop, there's a lot of genetic diversity in that spore print. And uh, years ago, before they started doing direct tissue cultures, if you were to take a spore print of a mushroom you wanted to grow, you had to do a lot of spore prints. You had to do a lot of petri dishes and slants to make sure you could isolate the strain that was the most aggressive. With the tissue samples, you can take the first mushroom that pops up in your project, which is usually an indication that it's a strong strain. You can take a tissue sample directly from that and get an exact replica of the mushroom. So, once the mushroom drops its spores and they land in suitable habitat and the hyphae is colonizing, colonizing the substrate, once two compatible hyphae find each other, they form a clamp connection and they essentially have mushroom sex. What they're doing is they're exchanging all their information on what it took for them to colonize and to survive in their substrates. So the mycelium forms after the two compatible hyphae meet, and that's when you see massive growth. If that project is going to stay in its home, and it's all colonized on the bottom, if the conditions become right, which is usually the King's Safari and Western Mushrooms proven very well in Italy, but they like 70 to 90 percent of the you could get mushrooms to fruit off your project if you just left it as it was. Once these chips are, once these chips are, are on the new substrate and they're decomposing it, they can actually be removed to either create more spawn. You can continue to colonize that log round. If you just did nothing and let that log round colonize in that bucket, uh, you would have life mycelium for probably a year before you had to move it or lose it. So here's this picture over here is King Strafaria on wood chip soil and coffee grounds. Uh, I was growing Worcester mushrooms on coffee grounds. I was just actually trying to build up on my cell in mass, as Craig Howder talks about. And then this project, I looked at it and I noticed that the King Strafaria on my cell was colonizing the coffee grounds. So I haven't read about that anywhere, but I just knowing that it's a white rock fungus, you can probably have white, it's a variety of white rock funguses grow, or at least decompose or compost coffee grounds. Uh, hopefully next year, maybe I get some pictures of things for color green and coffee grounds. This next picture is oyster mushroom spawn naturalized on toilet paper rolls and coffee grounds. So what I did is I took I took toilet paper rolls, I sprayed them with water, and then I stuffed, uh, I stuffed coffee grounds that have been mycelium with oyster mushrooms inside of it. I put it in a little container, so this, I put a bag over, bag over it to kind of uh, conserve the moisture and the humidity and the temperature of the moisture and humidity. And then about two weeks later, I looked at it and it was fully colonized. So once it's colonized at that stage, you can take that out and you can create just by laying out. One, one way you can do with toilet paper rolls is you can uh, cut strips of cardboard, you can peel off the back side, and you can just spread those out and roll them back up. And you can continue to grow through my cellar mass. Uh, did anybody, does anybody remember seeing Trav's uh, method on how to expand your mycelial mass with the containers? That's one of the most effective ways I've ever seen. And I was doing I was doing container projects years before I met Trev, but the way he does it and the way he expands it, it's just kind of changed the way I do it. So I'd like to recommend reading it in his book and kind of using that as probably the quickest way to build my cell in that. So here are a few mushrooms, I'm not really, can't really see them that great, but I'll try to explain what's going on. Here are a few mushrooms that will pop up in our, uh, our outdoor garden projects when we do culture, when we do sheep mulching, 
and we didn't get any time to this further fungi that we do mushroom composting. This first picture is a saccharella species. Uh, in Haiti, they call it John John. There's not a lot of substrates in Haiti where mushrooms can grow, and this is one of the few mushrooms, this is probably the only mushroom that uh, Haitians will eat. So it grows in their waste, it grows in their waste piles, and it's a good decomposer. But when Trav went down there and he talked about how to cultivate western mushrooms, it's going to have the kind of effect that it's going to create a food security for them that they didn't have it before. Uh, that one's called Saccharella cambodiana. It's, I don't know if people can eat it, but it's not going to poisonous. The next mushroom is the red bean Lupo agaricus. So that used to be known as Wapiota, but because of name changes that Gary was talking about last night, I think they heard that. It's really funny. It's good, now got a new name. It's still the same mushroom, but it's got a new name. The mushrooms don't know about the name changes, so they still continue to occupy their habitat as they always have. I found this mushroom about a month ago growing in grass in northeast Portland. And it's, I think it's a primary sapper, I think it has a wet line in its nose. I see it in a lot of Google culture projects around town. It's an edible mushroom. It's got some really novel constituents in it that are, once again, listed in Robert Rogers' book, The Public Pharmacy. The picture that you can barely see over there, that's a little yellow mushroom that grows on straw. It's called, called Obitius fictionellus. So it's just, um, it's just a straw compost mushroom. I see that on a lot of projects. I think it's better to have these mushrooms in your garden doing the decomposing work than not having them there. This one on the bottom is Poligo septica, the dog vomit slime. It's also known as a scrambled egg slime. Uh, kids seem to like dog vomit slime better than scrambled egg slime. It captures their imagination. This is a this is a very it's a really powerful white rot fungus. Actually, I'm not sure it could be white rot. It could be primary or secondary, but I see it growing on new wood chips. My friend uh, Zane had a big pile of wood chips growing in his yard that was a king's graffari at this spring. So he told me that he had a massive, a massive dog bomb slime on his wood chips. He said it was about five feet back. If you, would have put, if you would have been able to put up a camera to get a time lapse photography on it, it would have been pretty spectacular. <laughs> but he told me that after that, after that, after it grew and then it disseminated its spores, he said King's Safari came right up through it. Hmm. So oftentimes, some of the funguses in our gardens will prohibit the growth of other funguses because King's Safari has the ability to be a primary or secondary sapro. It was able to grow on the uh, bacterial remains of the dog bite This one in the middle is that's the Lactea. It's a little white mushroom that comes up in our gardens. Uh, I see it growing in plants. And it's just rebuilding the soil. When, when, mushroom, when these mushrooms are growing in our outdoor grow projects, and when they decompose, they leave. This bacterial rot that happens from them acts as a keystone, like a keystone soil. So if you see mushrooms rotting in the forest, if you were to go back there a year later, there would be a lot more biological life in that little area than if the mushrooms were grew through. And their spores, their spores will stay viable in the soil until the conditions become right. Uh, that could be anywhere from years to decades to centuries. That next picture is uh, Saccharella species growing in wood chips. There's 400 different Saccharella species that occupy ecological niches in western habitats. Not a lot of, lot of them is known, but it's good to know the genus. So if you're looking at mushrooms in your garden, your grow spaces, you can identify them. Macro identification characteristics for Saccharella are going to be a clustered habitat. So they grow in cesspitos. Pruning pattern. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a hydrophonus on the cap. So what that means is there's areas that will retain the original cap color, and there's areas that will, due to the weatherization, will become lighter. So if you can, I don't know if you can see it, but with hydrophonus, it's usually darker on the outside of the cap, and in the middle, it's lighter. 
hygrophonous on a mushroom cap is a macro identification characteristic. So macro identification characteristics are things you can see with the naked eye. When I take people out mushroom hunting or on foraging trips, uh, I like to teach them about macro identification characteristics so they can kind of identify mushrooms before they pick them. If you can identify mushrooms before you pick them, then you're not you're not supposed to do this in the first time around. But if you can identify mushrooms before you pick them, you'll have more baseline knowledge of their habitat that they grow on. Plus, if you pick a bunch of mushrooms and then take them home and you call up a mycologist late at night saying, hey, found some mushrooms and love you to ID them for, uh, you'll make you'll make longer lasting friendships with mycologists if you take a few notes on collecting mushrooms in the field and if you just grab a bunch of mushrooms and put them in a bag and hope that somebody has the time to that last mushroom is uh, Luco agaricus, Luco lucofites. So that used to be called Lepiota Lacina back in the day. David Aurora called it uh, Man on a Motorcycle, which was, you know, it was just a tribute to Man on a Motorcycle. It was Woman on a Motorcycle. And that was a tribute. It was, a, it was paying homage to women because the man on horseback mushrooms, tricholoma fulvirens, had been long known as the only gender specific <laughs> mushroom. We've come along in a short time and we still have a lot. <laughs> this mushroom, it, not a lot of people eat it. It's not really recommended for beginners because if you're not careful, you could mistake that mushroom with a deadly amanita. Uh, they don't really grow in the same habitats. This is a set, this is a probic mushroom. It grows in multi beds and woodchip gardens. The amanita, the deadly amanitas that grow in Washington, Oregon, are ectomycorrhizal, so they grow in oak trees and they grow in trees. But still, it's a mushroom with white gills, and it's just. You want to make sure that when people are going out and picking up mushrooms, that they don't do it frivolously because. This is one of the fields of study that we say can be deadly. There's not a whole lot of deadly mushrooms, but the few deadly mushrooms that there are out of tens of thousands that have been described, they occur in all human-based habitats, so we're more than likely to see them. Uh, let me see the next slide. Here's some more mushrooms that will appear in our virus. This one up here, uh, it's a gymnopilus, so it's it's a relative of a big laughing gym. This is a probic fungus that lives in woodchip piles. This one actually has a little bit of blue green staining on the margin of the stipe. Uh, it's good to have those mushrooms in your garden and not have any because they're doing all that the composition work. The mushroom in the middle is the yellow stainer. So, not all pink bottom mushrooms are edible. The pink bottom mushrooms that we find that smell like licorice or anise are edible. Pink bottom mushrooms that we find that stain yellow and that smell like uh, library paste or phenol are not edible. Uh, they usually grow in the same habitat, so just smelling them, smelling them can differentiate the edible from the non edible species. Uh, the next one is jelly fungus. It's witch's butter, Tremella, I think it's Tremella mesenterica. Those are fun to eat. I, I pick them off the tree and pop them. The next one is uh, Hypholoma fasciculari. It's the yellow sulfur tuft. You see this mushroom growing all over Portland in the spring and the fall. It's, it's in the wild areas. It grows on logs and people's gardens. It grows in parks. Identification, macro identification characteristics for the yellow sulfur tuft, which is poisonous, are the clustered habitat and the yellow, greenish yellow gills and spore. Uh, it's a good dye mushroom, by the way. And the yellow sulfur tuft has been implicated in micro, right, micro remediation strategies to control uh, the growth of honey mushrooms or other parasitic life fungus. This honey mushroom here, I think it's Armillaria pistoe. I took this picture in Portland in the fall. And usually they don't grow on grass, they're growing on the rotten wood of the tree that there was grass covering. This is a very popular mushroom, and this mushroom isn't growing in areas that are exposed to pollution. It's very good edible. And it is the world's largest organism. There's a honey mushroom patch in eastern Oregon in Mount County. It's 
There's a picture of mycelium mushroom on a hilltop picture where this mushroom has colonized the entire top of the map. They say it's 1,700 hectares in size and about 2,500 years old. There's some novel compounds that have been isolated from this mushroom that are, that Robert Lecture talks about in his book, Fungal uh, Pharmacy. The amount of mushrooms that come up on the world's living organism every fall is probably millions of dollars worth of mushrooms. Yet there's really no program established where people can go and harvest these mushrooms and turn them into either a food source or a medicinal, medicinal teacher source for the people in the area. Uh, that's one of the things I'd like to see in one of the slides I have next talks about the that picture in the middle, which you can barely see, is three check this three parasol mushrooms. So they start out, they look like drumsticks. And then by the time they get this tall, the cap opens up and they, open up, they have a really big uh, cap. They call them parasol mushrooms because they just look like a little parasol. The next picture, which you can barely see, is more saccharellas growing in grassy areas. Uh, like I said, there's hundreds of species of those, and not a lot, not a lot is known about them. A lot of the different species are just identified are differentiated by spore size. And that one at the end is a blue. It's a piece of new. So that mushroom is a cold weather mushroom. Trad Cotter has a video on his website mushroommountain.com where he takes some of these bluets and he puts them in a bag and freezes them. So once they're frozen. And they usually come up after the first frost. Once the bag is frozen, they'll take it out. They'll take the frozen mushroom mass out of the bag and they'll just stick it right on top of this compost. So, in the, as of, as over, in the over, over winter, the stuff will melt, the spores will disseminate, they'll trickle down, and in the fall, it usually gets fluid popping up on this compost. It's a wonderful way to take application. Uh, Trimides versicolor, turkey tail. Uh, there's a compound called crescent and turkey tail that is responsible for billions of dollars worth of medicinal mushroom drug sales in Asia and Europe. Why we're not doing it in this country remains a mystery to me. If anybody has an answer, we can go ahead and talk about that during the question and answer. Mm -hmm. Nothing personal. <laughs> turkey tail, uh, turkey tail produces a white rot in its host, so it means that it breaks down thin bark hardwood trees like oaks and alders really fast. Uh, Paul Stanley's mother had stage four breast cancer, and he got sedated with strain of turkey tail. He worked with the city of Hope Hospital in Los Angeles, and they got some of the turkey tails that he collected and cultured. He gave that medicine to his mother. She beat cancer. She beat fourth stage cancer in her 80s. So I think she's still alive. Uh, the healing power of these mushrooms is, is off the charts. The best way to extract the medicinal compounds from turkey tails and other medicinal mushrooms is the hot water extraction method, which is simply just cutting them up into slices and boiling them for 60 to 90 minutes. It can be made into tincture. It can be put into a jar. It's a pretty rich, fact. It's a pretty rich growth medium. So I've lost containers of turkey tail tea just by letting them sit on the counter for too long. Once they cool down after you put them in the jar, you want to stick them in the refrigerator within an hour or two. An interesting thing I played around with the dude, they actually work as a fairly substrate to go away from them. I've heard about that. I'd like to. I'd like to. I'd like to. I harvested a bunch of old ones off the tree that I wasn't going to make into a tea or nothing because they already had algae growing on them and everything. So I uh, dried them out real good and sliced them up and mixed them in with uh, wood chips and uh, uh, sawdust and uh, pasteurized them and they colonized them really well. They actually colonized but quicker than the wood chips did. I, I imagine because the cellular the structure. It looks like more future research can be done on different substrates than real mushrooms on. I heard over this weekend that oyster mushrooms can be grown on 200 different substrates, which makes them very, very applicable for different projects. That we know of. That we know of. Imagine how many more it could be. This 
next picture is turkey tail growing out of, it's growing through a nylon mesh sack. So I was in southeast Portland and there was this tree root, tree wad, this tree root wad that was wrapped up in this nylon mesh and it was sitting in the ground. The top part was exposed and there was turkey tail mushrooms growing through it. So I'm pretty sure that they were decomposing some of the material in the uh, synthetic mesh. And the first picture that was uh, that was turkey tail growing on a, a fruit tree in Corvallis, Oregon. And there was a windstorm, and we knocked down about 10 branches of the turkey tail. We took the turkey tails off those branches and made them into uh, powders and teas. We had like $200 from just a little windstorm. Sometimes you uh, chew on a bite. I've heard that. It gives you a little bit of energy and it keeps mm -hmm. your mouth going. Yeah, I've heard it's called hydrogen bubble gum. Yeah. What's hydrogen bubble gum? Hydrogen bubble gum. Yeah. Try going bubble gum. Yeah. Uh. And then you spit it out. And then you're just, you're just, you're, you're, you're colonizing more habitat because there's probably this close. This is the golden chanterelle. Uh, this is the state mushroom of Oregon. It's chanterelles mimosas. It loves second growth Doug fir, which is not a justification to go out and cut trees so we can get chanterelle out of time. Uh, revenues from this one species of choice edible mushrooms can replace timber company payments in rural counties in Oregon. So for many years, the timber companies were giving payments to rural counties because they were cutting down all their trees. So after a certain point, they didn't have a lot of trees to cut down, so the timber payments had stopped. Now a lot of those rural counties in Oregon, Washington, and other places, they don't have they don't have the kind of forests and ecosystems they had decades earlier. One of the ideas I think that we can do to make these rural counties a little bit more sustainable, better places to live, a little less hard scrabble, is to start having these mushrooms. The sale of these mushrooms we put into a fund that can contribute to the education and maintenance of how to keep these habitats for the mushrooms. <coughs> a lot of people get very good health benefits from being outside. And hunting mushrooms in the forest once you know what you're looking for is the kind of it's the kind of exercise that we, that uses it makes us use a lot of our faculties that we don't use in every day of our lives. For instance, when you're going to the forest to hunt mushrooms, you have different faculties that are working and that are, that are being activated than you do if you go into a market to buy mushrooms. So still, after all these years, the best way is to learn about which mushrooms are edible in the forest is to go with somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, learn one species at a time. Join a mushroom club. A lot of the mushroom clubs are what we call classical mycology societies. My home club in Portland, Oregon has been a mushroom club since 1949. Most of the officers in that club are in their 60s and 70s, so there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a, a gap in between uh, the people that are coming into the club that want to lead it into the next era, as opposed to the ones who are already there. Uh, hopefully, hopefully with, with people like Peter McCoy, radical mycology, and the other people who are just teaching these low tech methods of mycology. If we were going to be able to create a baseline of knowledge that's transferable to all regions of the country. A lot of these mushrooms grow in different areas of the country. So like, I don't think there's chicken in the woods that grows here in Colorado, or if it does, it's rare. The chanterelles that grow here in Colorado are much smaller than the ones that grow in Oregon, and California. Uh, let's see the next slide. This is Oregon reishi, Anaderma oregonense. It causes a brown rotten in host, which is primarily, primarily hemlock, but it also grows on conifers and some deciduous trees. This is a very powerful medicinal mushroom that's been used in Asia for centuries. The ones that grow here on this continent have similar constituents. Uh, this is a mushroom that can be harvested by local communities and can be turned into, it can be turned into a wide variety of value-added products. I learned from John Halliday that people are that people are they're drinking coffee with reishi and uh, 
uh, the way they disseminated this is they did it through multi level marketing, which I find is amazing. When I learned about multi level marketing in the 80s, we didn't have free sheet and copy. So. So, <coughs> so, this, and this is just another forest product that contributes significant amounts of money to struggling rural counties in Oregon and Washington. So, when you say that, do you mean um, so having people deliver in those counties? private figures that go out and sell to restaurants and directly inject money that way, or are you talking about sort of socializing the crop and having it be shared communal community? I think the second way would be much better. Of course. Of course. Because then what we could do is we could have small groups of people who are working with each other and they have a conservation plan. They can work in their local areas. There's a lot of areas, there's a lot of forested areas that have been poorly managed because it's expensive to go in there and cut the undergrowth. Undergrowth in forests creates really unhealthy conditions. When you get crown fires, that's because the undergrowth in the forest has been there for so long, it's just leaves a tremendous amount of fuel load. When you have a crown fire, when a crown fire burns, it burns like a foot to a foot and a half of topsoil, and it takes the natural processes a lot longer to reestablish that burn uh, habitat than it does as if it's, than if it's a healthy managed forest. If it's a healthily managed forest where people are taking out the undergrowth and doing selective trimming, you're going to get mosaic fires that burn intense. So they're going to skip around. They're not going to burn. They're not going to burn everything down to the ground. When you get mosaic fires burning in a habitat, you're going to have different. You're going to have different uh, different elapsed, quicker elapsed times of the colonized habitat. This is one mushroom that is, I think it's one mushroom with about seven or eight different species that can contribute a lot of money to these little rural counties. Let's go ahead and see the last slide. So this is the last slide. This is Comatopsis pinnacola. This is the red belt of polypore. It's probably one of the most common polypores that grows in this country. In Oregon, it's definitely the most common polypore. It grows on a hundred different tree species. It causes a brown rotten host. Uh, I've been picking this mushroom for a, year, a couple of years. I make tea and tincture out of it. And it's loaded with cytopenes. It reduces inflammation. Uh, it has properties that enhance the immune system. I have a feeling, once again, I have a feeling there's seven or eight different mushrooms in rural counties all over the country that could be harvested in a sustainable harvest kind of fashion. Can educate people on how to keep these habitats productive without being overrun or over harvested. And it can be a little bit of a legacy left for future generations. The way we're going now, where our natural resource forests are kind of just optioned off to the largest litter, it's going to take a long time for these forests to replace themselves. So, this is one of the things I'd like to see in the next couple of years is just kind of having groups of dedicated people. Fill ecological niches that have been hard to fill with top down government policies. Thank you very much. I'd like to open this up to questions and answers if anybody has any. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
powder dry for their flintlock rifles. So this says this fungus, has, these fungus, the polypore funguses, have a long tradition of being used by native cultures all over the world. But what they were mostly using it for was uh, fire starter or even the very coal uh, There are poisonous polypores in the country, and I have actually stated in a workshop or presentation before in the past that there were no poisonous polypores. I hope nobody has suffered any pain from my mistake. But now that I know, there's not, uh, it's really a good policy not to indiscriminately eat any mushroom or fungus without knowing what it is. The one that Robert Rogers talked about, the how, how a pores that caused some poisonings in Germany, I think it occurs in this country. But luckily, I don't think it's as big as the other cons that we know about. The cons that were mostly harvested in this country are uh, the anadermas, which are the hardest common relations, turkey tails, chicken of the woods. This one, this is the red delta power board. It's very common out here in Colorado as well. And, and there's, there's a couple of crack time power boards, which are part of the Polinus uh, cheese. Any other questions? Have you done any calculations of the logs or the culture beds? That's a good question. When I, the hoop culture projects I've done in Portland, I think a couple of them have had oyster mushrooms inoculated in them. So oyster mushrooms inoculated into a log, it can have ground contact without the ground organisms interfering with the fruiting of the oyster mushrooms. If you do that with shiitake mushrooms, the ground organisms will actually delay or prevent the shiitake from brewing. So if you're going to do a hooviculture project and you want to try to grow mushrooms in that, you'll put one of those logs that has oyster mushrooms or lion's mane or miko, you'll put it near the top or you'll put it near the edge to where uh, if the mushrooms do fruit out of it, you can actually pick them off. So if you have a, if you have a mushroom log and you bury it with two or three feet worth of debris, it's going to be years before you see mushrooms pop up. But if you position it on your Google culture bed to where you can see them pop up, you can extensively collect mushrooms on your Google culture project. Here So the low-tech culturing methods I use are the absolute lowest tech, cheapest ways to do it. It's just the way I've always done things. Uh, good resources for that would be Trad's book. Uh, give me your email address. I can send you some PDFs. I have a variety of PDFs by other people and by myself and low-tech methods. Uh, I've used cold water pasteurization for, for sterilizing straw. So what you do with that is if you don't if you don't have if you don't have a burner set up at a 55 gallon drum, you can take uh, half a bale of straw and you can soak it in water for the night. Trav recommends seven to ten days. I found anywhere from a day to ten days soaking straw it makes it work. You can soak your straw and then what you do is you'll you'll drain it. That straw water is rich in nitrogen. So some people will actually put the straw water that the straw was soaking in, they'll add it to their garden beds in the spring and it has baby plants. It's also got some anti antibacterial properties in it. The wet straw that has been soaking in there, it can be mixed into a variety of different ways. I've made oyster mushroom boxes out of pallets, uh, and oyster mushrooms growing in containers. It kind of this, the straw is rotten. So when the straw is soaking in water, it's an anaerobic environment, which means no aerobic organisms are growing it. When the straw is pulled out of the water, it's subjected, it's all, all of a sudden it's in an aerobic environment. So anything floating through the air or anything that was on it in an aerobic environment, those aerobic organisms will start to grow. So we like to colonize it. I tell beginners to colonize at a ratio of four to one, which means you would use four parts straw and then one part myself. After you have a couple successes with it, you can move it up to three parts to one. So if you take if you take your wet straw, you can lay a little bit of wet straw at the bottom of the bucket that's got holes in it, and you can sprinkle a little bit of spawn, spent mushroom substrate on top of it. That can be grain, it can be 
and sell it in straw and sawdust and straw. And then you'll, you'll just do a couple of layers. So 10 pounds of straw and then inoculate the by half a pound to probably one pound of straw. I'll put a little cover over the top of that bucket. I can even put a nesting bucket in it. And then in a couple of weeks that my selling will call as a straw. So what Trav recommends is he recommends building a bunch of building a bunch of my selling mass before you try to put it out. Once you have your colonized straw, and the colonized straw is going to be exhausted faster than like wood chips, you can use that to either continue to grow spawn or you can try to put mushrooms off. If you want to try to put mushrooms off of your colonized spawn, what you would do is you would, you would put it in an area where you can, you put it in an area where its temperature is kind of right. Cold weather species like temperatures from the 60s up until about 72. Warm weather species like temperatures from 70 to about 85 degrees. And, uh, if you have that bucket that's colonized with straw, you just put it aside and you put a bag over it. If the bag gets condensation on it on the inside, that's a good sign that it's off gassing and it's going to be And you just check every couple of days. Uh, just the low tech methods of growing mushrooms are a little bit easier to teach. Learn. And I have a feeling that even on uh, intellectual properties, techniques are going to eventually become open source. Reverse yes. Um, is it possible to grow multiple species of mushrooms in the same substrate? I've heard that, I haven't had an experience doing mm -hmm. this, but I've heard that if you put a primary saprobic fungus in the same habitat as a secondary saprobic fungus, the primary saprobic fungus will fruit first, and then the secondary saprobic fungus will fruit when the conditions become right. So you could stagger mushroom harvests. If you were to get, say if you were to have King's Rufaria, King's Rufaria, Shiitake, and then the deer mushroom. So if you have Cervinus growing in the same habitat, you'd have a primary requires primary separate, uh, the shiitake is primary, but it also has a secondary separate, and the deer mushroom is a tertiary separate. So extensively, you can get these mushrooms to in the same habitat in succession. I think this is what I worked on around it, and it's, it's an interesting to be able to be able to let Mother Nature do the work. I'll take one more question. Thank you very much for coming to the site right now. I'm going to say again on this PowerPoint presentation called Microphilia Emerging. I'm going to try to send a copy to uh, people so it can be downloaded and it can be used. Once again, please don't eat any mushroom or plant you can't safely identify. And we'll see you around.